Um, so we have, a, we have a good crowd with us, um, really glad. I'm gonna introduce myself and talk about the series. My name is Joey Arredondo. I'm director of Landmark Arts, which is exhibits and speaker programs at the School of Art. Thank you for coming. We have over 60 people in the, in the room right now. Um, this is the fourth lecture in our Race and Social Justice in the Arts speaker series. It's the last one for the semester, but we've, uh, we've decided to continue this in the spring. So please look forward to having more of these with really exciting people from all over the country, which is what Zoom allows us to do. And please look forward to having these. Um, we are supported by the Helen Jones Foundation. They've given us a really good grant for this year's programming. They've given, given us a really good grant for next year's programming. So we we're glad to have their support to you know to bring in speakers and exhibits from all over the country. Since we're pretty far removed from every every major city in Texas, um, so we'll have the presentation, and they, we will use the Q and A feature. Look for the Q and A button, and you will type in your questions at the at the end. Uh, or as you get your questions, type them in. And then when, the, when our speaker finishes, we will um, then read the questions and hear, have them answered for everyone to hear. Um, at this point, I'm gonna let our newest member of our painting faculty, Boriana Rosanova Ina, introduce our guest speaker. Thank you so much for coming. I will be going visually and audibly dark for the rest of the chat until we get close to the end. Hello, everybody. Um, I hope that you can hear me and welcome. I am so excited um, to uh, have Patrick with us today, Patrick Rohami. And before I um, get started with some more information about our speaker today, I just wanted to say thank you to Joe and to Landmark Gallery and the Race and Social Justice series for making this event happen. Um, on a personal note, it's been like, um, I've, lo I've been looking forward to it and it's going to be probably the highlight of um, fall 2020 for me. So I'm very, very excited that the day is finally here. Um, I had the pleasure of first seeing uh, Patrick Earl Hammy's work in 2011 at a group exhibition in Indianapolis that we were both a part of. In this show, a painting from his project, Significant Other, merited the Best of Show Award. Since then, I have stayed a big fan of his work and followed the creation of new projects such as Counterpoint and Birth Throws, which I'm sure he will speak about today. I should also mention that I have often used Patrick's work as an example to my own students who work in representation, as he is an artist who is very sensitive to the power of figurative painting in expressing notions of gender and race. And more specifically, I see his work as a wonderful example of how to draw attention to the body as a contentious site that exists between notions of violence, vulnerability, and tenderness. Um, before I open the stage to Patrick, I also want to briefly mention a few highlights from his biography. Uh, he studied drawing at Cocker University and received an, an MFA in painting from uh, University of Connecticut. His works and collaborations have been exhibited in venues that span the California African American Museum in LA, the Drawing Center in New York, the John Kohler, Michael Kohler Art Center and the Vassal Museum of Contemporary Art, both in Wisconsin, as well as the Kunstwerk Karl Schütte in Germany, the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center in Ohio, and the Zoe B. Art Center in Chicago. He was an artist in residence at the John Michael Kohler Art Center and the first recipient of the Alice C. Cole 42nd Fellowship from Wellesley College. His works are included in public and private collections, such as the David C. Driscoll Center uh, in Maryland, the Kinsey Institute Collections in Indiana, the Kohler Company Collection in Wisconsin, and the J.P. Chase Art Collection in New York, as well as the William Benton Museum of Art in Connecticut. He has been supported by fellowships and grants from the Joyce Foundation, Midwestern Voices and Visions, Puffin Foundation, and the Tan Foundation. Patrick Earl Hammy is currently an associate professor 
and the Chair of Studio Art at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and the School of Art and Design there. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Patrick Earl Hamm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Boriana. Thank you, Landmark Gallery. And thank you, Texas Tech, for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here, to be virtually with everyone and uh, have an opportunity to share my work with your community, engage in a dialogue, and, um, and not feel so alone right now. <laughs> um, so as, as Boriana was saying, I'm a painter, I'm a draftsman, a sculptor, an illustrator, an educator, but fundamentally, I'm a storyteller. I've been interested in how we tell and learn stories since I was a kid. Watching educationally framed cartoons on Saturday morning, to sitcoms after dinner with my family. Uh, as I learned more about art and myself, I became curious about issues related to cultural identity and the body and visual culture. Today, mostly, I use portraits and allegories to examine personal and shared Black experiences and to present stories that expand the understandings of others and invite viewers to consider how the tales we tell and how they, we express notions of self, community, and others today. Uh, to date, I've completed five long form projects that filter my own personal journey through spaces, relationships, and expectations that my black body navigates to really articulate the institutional, economical, and cultural migration of the collective Black body. So I want to jump into one of my most recent projects, which is Birth Rose. The project came out of 2015 when a few things were happening personally. A lot of my work up to up to up till now, from from graduate school to now, began begins with the personal and then considers uh, how it relates and enters into this larger conversation we have publicly. A lot of my early projects were they thought through um, personal tragedy, maturing in the 21st century uh, through these presidential early presidential elections like Barack Obama's first election to and, and bid against uh, John McCain uh, to moving out to the Midwest and working in Illinois uh, becoming really familiar with uh, some of the great things that are happening in the Midwest like um, the history of Afrocobra the legacy of like Expo Chicago being the first art fair in the country um, and just many awesome things about the regional art scene but equally being affected by the realities that I learned more about being immersed in, in, in the Midwest, which is the legacy of things like sundown towns, which are towns, counties, and uh, cities that have gone all white on purpose, primarily from 1890 to 1970, through violence, threat of violence, legally illegal ordinances. If you're a nerd like me and you've, uh, you're a fan of, of HBO's Watchmen or HBO's um, Lovecraft country, you've probably been introduced to uh, some of these historical uh, realities. So those works brought me up to 2015 where I was feeling like probably many of you inundated and, and oppressed by the numerous reminders of how little black life mattered on social, through social media uh, in America, you know, from, from earlier in, in, you know, in February with Trayvon Martin to you know, all the way up to George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. We've just seen over these last so many years you know, how black bodies are, are uh, disenfranchised, incarcerated, and you know, having and, and murdered. And um, so all of that was coming down on me, just like it's been coming down on many people. But personally, also what came together at that time was my mom had a stroke. And all of a sudden our relationship shifted dramatically where I was now her power of attorney. I was responsible for her health. Um, and it, it, it took, it was, it was a very short amount of time when I had to reimagine that our relationship was different and that she was a new person uh, and how to navigate these, these legal and, and financial and health realities. She lost her mobility she lost her voice, literally, and 
I started asking myself a kind of existential question of, well, who carries our family story? Where are they culturally remembered? You know, it's on me now. Um, and so one day we were out uh, spending time together at a facility that we moved her to when uh, brought her to, to Illinois with me from South Carolina where she was living independently. And we were talking outside in the courtyard and just having a good time. And I, I took my camera out and just wanted to capture the moment of joy and, and happiness. And I asked her to smile. And she looked at me and she gave me this fierce look. And I said, just jokingly, I was like, oh, mom, just, just smile. And she looked at me again fiercely and she put her fist up and she shook it. And I knew then that I was looking at a fighter. I was looking at my mother, even through her stroke, even without her voice, even without the ability to really move besides her arm, uh, she was teaching me things. And so I photographed her like that. And, oh, excuse me, Joe, can you uh, uh, give me share permit permissions, please? Joe? Okay. Try it now. Got it. And this is a photo that came out of that, that conversation. I decided to, to, to paint this photo for several different reasons. First and primary, starting with the personal. Uh, it was a way for me to think through who she was now, what, who, what our relationship was, to allow myself to recognize she was a new person performing new narratives, uh, exploring a new phase in her life. And now she was strong and still independent and still fierce, still teach me something, still had a dream um, and, and was and determined to live her life. So this is a portrait that I painted. It's approximately 80 inches tall by 68 inches wide, um, done with oil on canvas. Uh, I became really interested in thinking about imagery as an object. And so you'll see in many of the paintings I'll show that the background is either raw or pulled away from the edges, uh, sometimes to reveal the process. As you see in this image, many of the drips uh, just show the layers build up that lead to this, this facade of a, of a, of a still image. Um, my paintings are typically uh, expressive where I'm very interested in the intimacy that comes with uh, revealing the stroke of the brush, where for me, intimacy historically in painting, I think about you know a hero like Johannes Vermeer, you could look into a quiet uh, Dutch corner of, of, of a house and uh, have lighting coming in from, from a window and people just you know reading a letter or playing an instrument, being a very intimate and personal scene. But building on the legacies of of, of the 20th century and the abstract expressionists and the ways they try to put their body and their psychic and their psychic self into these paintings, I really want to, and I really feel like I inherited um, a different type of intimacy where being able to give access and be vulnerable in not just your subject matter, but in how you work in your process, allowing the viewer to see your brain thinking through passages and moments of, of, of process as if they were looking over your shoulder, felt like a different type of intimacy that I was really excited about. And like, I, I bring into these works. But another reason I did that work was because of, of, of media like this. So Gone with the Wind was a huge success when it came out. And if you're familiar with the work of Kara Walker, she's talked about it very vividly of how she saw um, uh, Vivian Lee, uh, Scarlett O'Hara as this, 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 this idol that she wanted to look up to and be like. But at the same time, the way that her character, uh, you know, within the universes in time and universes continuity, and of course the time period was created, uh, you know, owned slaves and treated them a certain way and had a different, very particular type of relationship to black people. And, you know, uh, Miss Walker found that very disturbing and it really, you know, really shocked her into a lot of the work that she makes up till today. But for me, I focus on Hattie McDaniel in this who plays, uh, uh, Scarlett, Scarlett O'Hara's Mammy, and how littered 
art history is, visual history is with these types of representations of, of black women in painting, in movies, in posters, uh, black women were seen as definitely not the center, not the protagonist of, of, of the story, usually as, as caretakers or in servitude to, 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 um, to white owners or white employees. Uh, and so in part, what I like to do with paintings in birth rows where I explored not just my mother's painting, but after I completed that one, I moved through my matriarchal line looking at my grandmother and great grandmother as well. Uh, her, mo her mother and, and, and grandmother <clears throat> to create more space for black women to occupy various different positions in the history and the canon of paint and, and art. Um, and so part of a big part of what, I'm, what I try to do is not just share my story and not just try to through my story speak to uh, maybe what's happening now or in the world, but really engage in the institutions that we invest in, the institutions that we look to, to see ourselves reflected, to understand our collective stories, our historical stories. And so Birth Rose was and is not just about sharing my own personal journey, but engaging with that history. I completed that portrait of my mother um, uh, and I was invited to do a show at a gallery in New York by, by a friend and artist. And the gallery space was right across from the, 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 the Whitney Museum of Art. And he was really excited about that portrait and really wanted me to do a portrait of my dad that, you know, of, 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 of a similar age uh, with a similar kind of gravity to it. And even though it was needed, I needed to go through that and make that painting personally, culturally, uh, historically, uh, I, I, I didn't know if I could revel in more black pain and trauma. Uh, so I took a left-hand turn. I decided I, I would create a new work for this exhibition, but, an exhi but, a, but a work that celebrated joy, black joy. Um, this was taken from or inspired by a photograph of my dad and mom on their wedding day. Uh, it was 1976 and these colors and, and, and uh, setting, I hope feel very steeped in that time, that the sense of nostalgia. Um, I was trying to navigate many different visual narratives as I was making this, you know, physically they were in a picture plane where uh, my dad was seated higher than, than my mom and he's taller than her generally. So the decision to split these into a diptych uh, allowed me to kind of reformat them on an equal plane while still acknowledging in the schism that happens in the middle uh, that, that difference in power dynamic, but also for me personally, um, as, as, they, as I matured around uh, the, moving into high school, they had split. And I wanted to acknowledge that even though they stayed married and they were a couple and, and there was love uh, there, that that was a reality that, that's embedded in a relationship is, is a, a real schism as well as a visual uh, metaphor. <clears throat> the background was inspired. I began working on these raw linen backgrounds uh, as a kind of hat tip to some of my uh, favorite painters from that time. I think about artists like Leon Golub um, and Francis Bacon working on uh, raw linen canvases, uh, surfaces. I was also, you know, inspired by other heroes from that time period, like Barclay L. Hendricks and the, the glitz and glamour of, of black individuals he brought to his almost magazine cover like uh, paintings that presented the everyday, you know, everyday person, everyday black person as a human and not as a, as a, as a fictional character, not as an idea coming from white authors, but as, a, as the person they were. And that was radical and revolutionary at times. So I, I was really interested in tapping into some of those histories aesthetically, visually, uh, materially, and experiencing and allowing space for Black joy to be seen and uh, thought about. So in Birth Rose, uh, the title came to me for Birth Rose really 
during Barack Obama's second presidential bid against Mitt Romney. And what I was thinking about at the time is, is there was a lot of conversation about the ideal of, the, of, of whatever is white and normal dying. Uh, there were a lot of conversations about people who were feeling like they were losing power, losing authority, losing centralism, uh, lashing out, uh, you know, taking more um, radical or desperate command of women's bodies, rewriting healthcare uh, in order to reclaim some authority over you know, women's bodies, um, doubling down on matters related to, um, to black bodies uh, and like in terms of the legal system and, and others. And it felt to me like a type of death throes, like it was a death throes of a certain type of, type of idea of, of what is normal, what is American, what, is, what, is, uh, what has been historically seen as, as uh, white privilege. And so, okay, if, if these ideas are coming to, to a space where they're threatened or they're feeling like they're, that they're, that the ideas and the power is losing or waning and are flailing around in these types of death throes, then what are we birthing as Americans? What, what are we making new space for? Can we make new space for things? And so that was some of the, the, the impetus for the title and, and broadly the ideal of birth throws. And so I wanted to, in this piece here, Untimely Ripped, to literally engage in a conversation on birth. <clears throat> here I picture my own birth with uh, you know, um, a mother and several medical professionals, all are women except for myself, in a, a surgical room you know, um, performing a cesarean section. So the seemingly simple ideal of representing this, uh, for me, uh, takes on many layers. I want to bring together the emotional, the psychic, the financial, uh, the professional, the time labor that it takes to go to school and study how to get, how to deliver, to, to do surgery, to care for, uh, to care for newborns, for the risk that mothers and black women in particular uh, go through when dealing with the patriarchal hospital system, being trusted, being uh, believed when there's an issue or a blood clot we've seen in a uh, you know, more recent case with Serena Williams very publicly um, with her, uh, with her birth, birth of her daughter. Um, to the tax, the tax money and the funding that goes into supporting a hospital that, that, that is making the effort to bring this life into the world. And if we can consider all those, all those, all those, that time, energy, money, labor coming together to bring one black life into the world, it might create new space for us to consider was it, what does it mean on all those different levels and more to rip a black life in the world? How do we revalue or value differently black life when we, when we funnel in and humanize one individual in one moment, a, a kind of climactic moment? Um, I worked with a lot of medical professionals, uh, talked to several mothers who came to my studio just to get the, the feeling right, to get the, the, the gown that the mother wears right, to, to, to work at the instrumentation, uh, to feel very, very much present and, and, and authentic. <clears throat> but as a storyteller, <laughs> I, I wasn't stopping there. I was really interested too in, in building in these historical layers of meaning. So Untimely Ripped is an allusion to uh, Shakespeare's Macd uh, Macbeth and particularly the character Macduff, spoilers. Um, there was a prophecy in Macbeth that he would be foiled by a man not born of a woman. And over the course of, of the, the play, Macbeth goes from you know, someone really trying to do right by his people to being a tyrant. And Macduff, it, we, we learn in the end, was born by a cesarean section. I was born by a cesarean section. According to a lot of, 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 of documentation, around 52% 50, of Americans are born that way. Um, was prophesized to take down the tyrant Macbeth would become. And so, by, and, and was referred to in, you know, in the play frequently as, as um, 
you know, untimely ripped was a metaphor or a way of talking about cesarean. It was a phrase that was used to, to, to talk about cesarean section. Uh, I wanted to, to make allusions to that and to Macduff in particular in order to consider the black body even furtherly differently. That depending on your vantage point of where you come into this conversation, the coming black body can be a hope. It can be a, a hope or a, a symbol of revolution to take down whatever tyrannical or oppressive um, metaphors that are literal or real in this real world. Or it could be a threat or a warning if you are the metaphorical Macduff or Macbeths. So Untimely Ripped was all of those things. But I had to just, I had, the art nerd in me had to add one more layer. And that's when I started thinking about um, paintings like this by Thomas Aikens, The Gross Clinic from 1875. So in this, uh, uh, Aikens paints Dr. Gross performing uh, one of the first successful, excuse me, um, surgical procedures uh, that was an alternative to just amputation. In here, in this theater, you see lots of students and other professionals looking almost bored, you know, studying and watching on as he's, you know, standing very authoritatively, you know, teaching and lecturing about uh, about this work he's doing. And the one woman who's been cited per, per, either as a student or even as this, uh, the patient's mother is turned away in horror. And so, you know, as a way of, again, giving more space to our scenes of medical professionals, scenes of, of surgical inquiry and narratives around painting and how male dominant they've been, works like uh, Untimely Ripped are meant to provide more variety and more space to all these women who are schooled and active, delivering medical professionals, risking their lives, caring for each other, caring for each other, caring for this mother in order to bring life into the world as a way of, of giving more room to how women are seen and understood, uh, discussed and perform within painting and arts history. As I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, just feeling all this, these are just some statistics that barely give a scratch into the types of, of inequities that we're seeing and navigating uh, in terms of gun violence and uh, the, um, the risk of, of death by handguns and the, the, the um, unbalance in terms of, of mortality rates of blacks and brown peoples in America. We're also seeing some numbers here about incarceration, uh, how much more likely it is to be incarcerated as a black and, and brown person in America. Uh, again, this barely begins to scratch the surface. I bring this up just to remind us that, uh, that humans are behind these numbers. And not just these individuals who are primarily affected are, are the ones that are deeply affected, but that as we as a culture um, condone and, 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 pro and proceed with, with policies and behaviors that reinforce uh, all of these narratives, they affect us. And so I can only speak to myself. In 2017, after uh, beginning birth throws and thinking about um, how I've just been deeply affected. I mean, I'm trying to articulate this because this was 2015 and it's not new. You know, I, I lived part of my life in South Carolina um, and was definitely a, a, a victim of racial profiling, pulled over many, many times for doing nothing but being black. Uh, was lucky and feel very lucky that I was able to make it past statistics, to make it out of South Carolina, to make it out with my life, without being incarcerated, making it into university, making it out of university, becoming uh, one of the few that wind up at institutions like mine and at this level of, of, of professional success as an artist. Uh, and so underneath some of that is maybe some guilt too, that I'm really you know feeling and so I try to 
try to think about this objectively, try to scholarize about this, but it's also deeply personal. I'm also implicated. And so if you, if you hear, hear me catching up or, or stumbling a little bit, it's because, you know, it's, 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 it's like, like maybe what WB Du Bois talked about a little bit, like being double conscious, like I'm going back and forth all the time in my life as instructor, as, as human, as artist. And they're all the same person, but I'm, I feel like it's juggling. And so in this particular work um, titled Auditor, Mouthpiece and Witness, a kind of trilogy of works, they're 80 by 68 each, uh, meant to be seen about an inch apart from each other. And in this, I'm, it's, it's a self-portrait. I presented myself in flux uh, as a way to speak to how impossible it is to, to capture a single person's identity in a static image. That's only one facet of a person. Even in these layered images, this person is still so much more than just one moment. Even if that moment is, is, is articulated through a series of months of painting and building up relationships, which what painting can do so well, that it's still more than that. It's still much more complex than what can be captured on the image. As a way to reference the Legion, that is that just my body in this particular example stands in for the many that are dead, dying and being remembered. Um, <clears throat> it's also a way for me to acknowledge some of the contemporary technologies that are available in, sort, in order to make imagery like this and how I can implicate the technology as a way that we can temporarily share and navigate these types of uh, tragedies, uh, ways we find uh, to build community, to stay active, to share more stories, to, uh, and to hold accountable through videos and through our voices, uh, the systems of power that perpetuate these occasions. I worked in a, a, a kind of newsprint like pattern. They seem gray, but they're, they're, they're very warm when up next to an actual gray as a way of nodding to the historic ways that we shared information and knowledge and, and activism uh, and stories uh, in newspapers of the 60s and, and 70s. And so all these different things are, are coming together and, conf uh, and, and, um, and synthesizing in these works to speak to a state that I hope we will move through uh, where this, this work will seem ancient history at some point, but how black bodies are situated today. I allude to uh, titles like auditor, mouthpiece, and witness as ways of, of keeping the loom of, of legalities and the legal system in the conversation. You know, auditor, one who wit, one who takes account, mouthpiece, one who speaks on others' behalf. We see that uh, used sometimes interchangeably with lawyer and witness, one who bears account. Like, I wanted to keep uh, foregrounded how our bodies have such a strong relationship to the to the penal system and to to leak into the law. So, making these works and making them for people like us in places like this. Uh, whether they, and how they go into museums, how they go into galleries, into, per, into collections, all of that is also part of um, the work. It's not just the pieces themselves, it's how they move through these systems where maybe they haven't historically been or they've been very marginalized numbers um, or they haven't had as much representation in terms of that, that diversity, not just diversity that is being there, but even within the, the, the subject, like giving more spaces for stories to be more dynamic and more varied. But it matters here too. This is an exhibition in Wisconsin, in, Mil in Milwaukee, uh, several years ago, and some students from uh, from the inst from the institute there, uh, art students, came to this opening, and I was so humbled and moved by just their them sharing how much it meant for them to see an artist like themselves in their city, a city that you know isn't unique but has been. Uh, um, for a long time, very harsh on the black community there, um, very unequal, uh, very dangerous, uh, very unwelcoming. Uh, that to see works like this that tapped into some of the experiences that they think through, that they lived through, the joy they had, uh, the hope they have as students to be able to 
to move the needle forward. I want to share this image here because this is what it's about too for me. This is what really keeps me going uh, in the classroom, in the studio, and as a person. So inspiration. Inspiration was a huge uh, part of the Counterpoint Project that myself and um, scholar and former uh, prima ballerina at the Dance Theater Harlem, Endelon Taylor, came together to create. So this collaboration came out of a conversation around mastery. We were invited to talk on a panel, both of us around the ideas of mastery. And, and from that conversation, a few things became really, really clear and our relationship just grew from there. One, we're both black artists that are, and she's a ballerina. We're both black artists steeped in practices that are, that derive from Europe. That the, with the technology then and almost up to today had never been really positioned to consider us. It wasn't available or we weren't expected to even access it as a technology. Dance, the body, painting as a movement or as a, as a, as a visual strategy. Um, and how we navigated those historically and predominantly white mediums and spaces, we had a lot of overlap. And so from that conversation, whether it's in the studios or in the classroom, we move forward with, with a project that could bring together visual art and dance that could create a kind of interdisciplinary presentation of performances, of panel discussions, of lectures, artworks uh, that could speak to the current contributions of black ballerinas in, in today's companies, could speak to the nature of how ballet has changed, where you have people like Misty Copeland uh, and Ingrid Silva who are represented by Under Armour and Activia, I mean, it's, 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 it's big business. And hopefully very similar to Serena and Venus Williams in tennis, open up space for young black people and it's particularly women to see themselves uh, moving into that professional industry and knowing their options and that they're reflected. So here's one of the paintings I did of Chira Robinson. She's from Cincinnati, but she's based in London. She's, I believe the only black ballerina at the time currently based in London, while there's black ballerinas that come through London, she's currently there in, in a company. She was also, uh, we had to keep that under wraps while we were doing this, but she was uh, finalizing talks to present um, the first ever skin tone point shoes. Like, oh, let me correct. Brown to black skin tone point shoes. Uh, I, that might sound shocking, but up into 2019, um, all these centuries of ballet, no one had ever actually made point shoes commercially for black and brown people's skin tones. Uh, when you did see them, they were because they were being hand painted by the ballerinas themselves. So she, she was the, uh, one of the first people to, to be the, 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 the face behind, or the feet <laughs> behind these point shoes. And uh, it was really a pleasure to work with her and everyone who was involved. There were five uh, ballerinas, it was cross-generational. So we had uh, people as young as 12 and 13, all the way up to in their 50s. Um, I really want to approach this and lean into uh, elements of Afrofuturism. You know, uh, Afrofuturism, some of you might more popularly uh, know it through uh, movies like Black Panther. It's more than just an aesthetic. It's, a, it's, a, it's an ideology of, of imagining oneself in spaces and places where they've never been, when one's never been imagined before. It, it comes out of, of science fiction and uh, looking at the canon of science fiction, mostly written by white men, and not seeing Latinx, not seeing Black people, not seeing uh, people of Asian descent in the future, you know, in these fantastical environments, where are they? If we can't imagine them there, will we survive to make it there? Is that what we're saying by not, by not, they're not being there? And women, usually, um, you know, especially women that, that don't identify as, as, as a, as cisgender or straight are absent from, from, from uh, science fiction as well. But even the ones who do typically are relegated to damsel in distress or the one, the one character um, that has you know, a supporting role. So Afrofuturism is it, at its core meant to open up um, 
intellectual, imaginative, speculative spaces for people that have not seen themselves reflected. And it's moved into, you know, aesthetics too. You know, we see artists like um, musicians, like Sun Ra uh, and Earth, Wind, Fire, all the way to uh, Missy Elliott and Janelle Monet. more recently, you know, really employing the aesthetics of Afrofuturism for decades, uh, building up what would become, you know, kind of captured uh, more, more recently in Black Panther. So here I wanted to work with lighting as a metaphor to think about these, these women uh, sitting in a more dramatic space contemporarily, a more theatrical space, but allude to a space that uh, could, where they might have existed in the deep past, but they also might and will exist into the deep future. This is Carol Crawford. She, uh, she was, uh, her, her, she's been in a wheelchair for a long time and it cut her, her performative dance career short, but even through being bound to a wheelchair, she still established her own company after being a prima ballerina for many years. She established her own company, she continued to teach, and she contributed uh, to this project uh, in, in, in a video where she, she spoke about her history, her time, her experience, her thoughts over uh, a performance that a, a, a younger ballerina was doing of one of her performances um, from, when she, from when Carol was younger. And so we wanted to really think about, you know, how differently able bodies can continue on as, as and teach us through movement and through themselves. We worked with clothing designers, uh, a web designer to create an archive of, of black ballet, uh, black ballerinas contributions. So we developed an archive on mob ballet, M-O-B ballet.com. Uh, Work with clothing, uh, clothing designer here, uh, Alice uh, Senzato to develop you know, this aesthetic and this look that, that the ballerinas would, would wear. Um, she is of, uh, of um, Brazilian and uh, Japanese descent. And so through our conversations, uh, you know, ideas like, like the floors that ballerinas uh, perform on, um, or at least the cultural imagining of the floors being these wood kind of slatted, you know, maybe even light oak, you know, kind of ballet studios. Um, thinking about that brought us to this moray pattern that could reference, you know, cut wood, but wood became something that we thought about even more deeply and critically. Uh, we thought about a Japanese tradition of taking wood and through something called shushugiban, uh, burning it and blackening it in order to harden it to those elements and then cladding your house in it. And it's even more durable than a lot of American siding. Uh, that metaphor was kind of beautiful to, to me at least of, of thinking about this wood that when you cut it, it's very blonde, very, very metaphorically white. And literally through, through fire and forging, it blackens, it darkens and becomes more durable. And that metaphor there of how white, predominantly and historically white companies um, become more rich and more dynamic as more and more black and brown ballerinas join them and change the conversation and add to it in terms of the bodies we expect, athleticism, um, that that's possible, differing athleticism that's possible, um, was just one of the things that we thought through and talked about when developing the clothing. And here was us on, on a performance night, um, you know, just celebrating. So I'm gonna move forward because of time uh, a little more quickly. Uh, this is a portrait of Romar Beer and I was asked by the Smithsonian Institution uh, a couple of years ago to do a portrait of him in a show called Men of Change that would travel around the country uh, to many institutions over a course of three or four years and, and celebrate uh, 25 black men who have changed American culture. They invited 25 artists to, uh, to respond to each of these 25 men and reframe them through their art. And I was very fortunate to be asked to do a hero of mine, Romar Bearden, who's known for his activism, his collage work, his authorship, uh, his community building. And so I tried to take what I, what I do as, as a paint, as painting, and find a way to pay homage to the collage aesthetic that he pioneered in, in his own work, um, but keep it and make it mine. Uh, and so this work is also 80 inches by uh, 68 inches wide and is housed in this exhibition that's, uh, 
that has the scaffolding, has infogra infographics, information. There's, you can see other artists' works there, has quotes by the artist and quotes by the artists like that that have that reflect, responded to the the, um, the the change makers. The company, well, we should do it all that that is doing this installation really thought about uh, these bars that can hold at the same time the idea of scaffolding and building up and passing on information. But similar to the titles in my, my paintings, Witness, Auditor, and Mouthpiece, not allow us to easily forget how tangled um, our narratives are, not just in, in success and in celebration and excellence, but also in strong and systemic efforts to incarcerate, to hold down, to marginalize. And so they function like scaffolding, but they also function like bars. Um, in at the beginning of this year, uh, like many of you, uh, not knowing what to do and not knowing uh, where COVID was going to take us, I stayed hunkered in my, my house. I set up shop in, in my basement here. And while it didn't, and my studio, my, my main studio is on campus, um, the, camp, uh, the university campus was shut down. So I had to find a way of just continuing to work and not knowing or not being ready to jump right back into traditional painting. I started doing some sketching, first uh, analog with, ch with charcoal. But then eventually I got the courage up to break out and start trying uh, to do some digital work. I had never done digital work before. I had never done digital painting. Only thing I do is use Photoshop to edit photographs in preparation for painting. And so I was afraid, <laughs> I was nervous. Uh, I really didn't know what I was doing in terms of the technology, but I, I understand paint. I understand bodies and form. And so I went back and looked at a lot of the references from an earlier body of work I did called Significant Other and you know, used it as a jumping off point to explore light and color and mark making and this, 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 the tablet and the, the, digital, the digital pen and all these different types of things. And this is some of the early studies that came out of of, of those experiments. But also at the time, uh, I didn't just wanna do studies for the sake of studies. I wanted to, uh, maybe this comes from just being in the house and, and having a lot of TV time too, <laughs> this over the summer. Uh, I have a huge love of comics and of vampires and of horror. Um, we see, uh, I think about, you know, like the, the, the rise of what some scholars are calling ethnographic. Which we, which we see in practice in movies like Get Out and Us, um, where horror, like Candyman too, like horror through the lens of the black experience uh, takes on a different angle and opens up different criticalities of to consider the other, to consider fear of difference. And so all that stuff for me conflated, thinking about uh, this really cheesy campy movie from the 80s called Vamp where Grace Jones, who's amazing, uh, and Keith Haring, who collaborated together uh, many, many times in, in, in life and in art, uh, collaborated in this movie where she played a lead vampiress, a head vampiress. Uh, I also, you know, again, stick, stick with the vampires at the same time, a huge fan of Anne Rice and thinking about the, the kind of room she gave to vampires in her books and expanding the mythos beyond Bram Stoker. And that led me to, to bring that into this digital exploration I was doing to create this work, A Damned Queen, uh, in homage to Grace Jones and Keith Haring. The smaller work, the study that led up to this uh, one on the left, uh, kind of looks more like a, like a, a Japanese oni, a demon, um, but it ultimately turned into this work on the left, which at the time I was experimenting with, uh, with, with you know, the boundaries between it, like looking digital, but looking analog. So I would, you know, go in and work it around the edges here on this big uh, high res sheet of, of, of plywood to make it look like it was painted on plywood. I even, you know, did this methodical kind of um, hand work down here to make it feel like there was gravity and the paint was dripping, even though it was digital. I've moved past that. I'm not so interested in that kind of um, uh, effort to, to uh, seem uh, analog and traditional, um, but it was my first foray, foray into uh, into like really combining some thoughts and ideas with my digital hand and rendering and lighting and and the colors that I had nurtured up to that point. 
But from that conversation, that led to, uh, sorry, from that, from that work, that led to me remembering a conversation I had, and I mentioned at the beginning of this, I'm a huge nerd, right? Uh, I go to Comic-Con with my wife uh, probably every year, every other year. And last summer, we had this conversation with a, with a really fun guy named Jim Eccles about his comic that he had, he had created called Vamp. And um, uh, I share with him my love of Vamps. And literally for half an hour, we went back and forth just doing what some nerds do. And we just kept up, trying to up each other about what we know, what we know. And it was a really good relationship that formed very, very quickly. And we stayed in touch. And so after doing those initial works, I thought about his book. I broke his comic books out that he shared with me there that he let me uh, have. And I just started to jump in and do some takes on some of the books that he was uh, working on. And so long story short, these three images here are some variant covers that I did for the book that, uh, that are gonna be, that a few of these have been published already. And then the one on the right is being published, uh, was just published last month and is the fourth book in the series. Uh, where we're looking at his character, Julian on the left, Ben in the middle, and then Ben, Julian, and uh, one of the primary vampires, Sarah at the bottom, and then this shadowy kind of silhouetted uh, figure is Bruno, another uh, vampire. And the story is really integral. I wanted to nod to the, to the kind of 80s that I was already swimming in with the other work. So maybe this has a little throwback vibe to some uh, 1980s Predator posters or even... Um, if you're a fan of Big Trouble in Little China, if you've ever seen that movie with Kurt Russell, maybe some of the aesthetics and the, the colors of that. So I'll wrap it up there, but I'd love to leave room for questions about process, about materials, painting, digital work, uh, thoughts and ideas around concepts, ideas, uh, the professional art world, whatever you wanna know, I wanna leave it open to, to answer. So what are your thoughts? Let's discuss. You can find more about me at those places there. So thank you. Thank you, Patrick, so very much. <laughs> I'm not sure if everybody can hear me. I think Patrick can hear me. I hope everyone else can hear me. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. It was so sincere and so moving. And I, I appreciate so much like learning um, some of your background and those early paintings of your mom were just terrific. And so um, it was a really um, great lecture and a very well-rounded um, um, talk about your work. So I am seeing that there is quite a few uh, questions already. Uh, I just want to remind everybody to use the Q&A to continue adding your questions. We probably can take another 10 minutes or so. Um, so I'll just go ahead and start reading them. Uh, okay, so the very first one um, comes from uh, Shashwat Baral, uh, and uh, this is what they're asking. What do you think about the Asian lives that has um, been in modern America compared to Black lives. Also, how about Vice President-elect Kamala Harris representing uh, biracial um, people between Black and South Asian, and she's in such a high position? What are your views on that? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, thanks for the question. Uh, maybe the answer is going to be really simple, but I think in terms of uh, Vice President Kamala Harris, that's amazing. I mean, I don't, I don't know what more I can add be, beyond, uh, you know, it's an it's amazing moment uh, for her. It's an amazing moment uh, in terms of representation, but more importantly, it's an amazing moment because someone like her is going to really be passionate about getting work done. Representation is one facet of it. Uh, it's a start, but as I mentioned with my own work, it's not just about there being images of, 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 of black and brown people in difference, but those things need to move through the systems that have, where they've not been very frequently. So, you know, the fact that she's not just reached this point, but all the work that it took for her to move through the legal system, to move through the layers of policy and politics and up the echelon of, of, um, of different administrations to reach this point should all be acknowledged and celebrated. And then hopefully the work continues. And, and it's not just about being representative of, of, of difference, but, but being active through that to address matters that are concerning and important to people who identify as different. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Patrick. Um, I'm going to read a question from uh, Guy Fremont. Um, so she says, thank you for sharing your brilliant work, Patrick. Can you speak further about your approach to the edge of an image within your paintings in Untimely Ripped, which I think is a terrific painting. Uh, I'm noticing the negative space that lines the image, suspending it within the physical bounds of the canvas. Mm -hmm. Thank you, no, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Guy. You know, Guy, Guy and I are, are also friends outside of this. Um, I'm happy to, to, to be able to connect with you here. Um, yeah, no, I'd love to talk more about that. So um, around that time, it wasn't Untimely Rip wasn't the first one, but around that time I was making several paintings and you know, I, I started pulling them away from the edge, as I mentioned earlier, to kind of you know, really give more, um, more, more visible space to the process, the layers that build up, not just seeing the layers with an image, but even at the bottom with the drips. But as the tops and the, and the sides start to pull away from the edges, the tension between the edge of the, the paint and the edge of the canvas became really exciting for me, just as a, 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 a empathetic moment, just feeling that tension of that live edge and how it vibrates around. But it also, I'm a big fan of manual photography. One of my huge, huge heroes is Sally Mann and uh, the way she uses uh, manual photography and all kinds of, of different uh, happy accidents that she, uh, that she um, strategically sets up for and the way she treats her plates and the way she treats her chemicals, um, the ways that, that you know, uh, traditional photography can leave those live edges. I, I, I like that parallel there. I really was ex interested in exploring uh, the paint, not as a window, but as an, an object that was on the surface. And so, you know, even from Untimely Ripped, I've continued to work on raw linen, um, even if there's background there, because, you know, I, I want to lose some of that that that, uh, that facade to 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 remind that even within this illusion that there's still materiality, there's still paint, there's still process. Okay, wonderful. Um, so there's a a couple of um, more like thank yous. One of our grad students, Sarah Drescher, says thank you so much for sharing this. Um, and then we have another um, great talk. I loved it from Haley Deshaw. Uh, and then Sarah comes back to ask, can you talk a little bit more about nostalgia in your work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, so personally, well, let's see. I mentioned I'm a storyteller and we've seen more and more people becoming more and more vocal about Hollywood's kind of uh, probably sometimes frustrating practice of, of recycling old stories, right? Of them going back and like bringing things back up every 30 years, 20 years, sometimes even less than that with Spider-Man. We're seeing like so many Spider-Mans like run after the other, you know, in one decade. Um, but that's not new. That's not new. Hollywood has, has understood for a long time that there's a 30 year cycle, whether it be um, because people that became, uh, kind of fans of a, of a, of a franchise uh, grow up and then they're at a different place with a different access to income and they can reinvest in that franchise or they want to pass it along to their children. Think about Star Wars, for example, right? That's just a perfect example. Um, and the same thing happens in other places that stories are told where they're, they're, they're recycling. So some of that is part of it, you know, like, uh, like, like even clothing wise, like we're seeing a huge return to things that were, probably popular, probably shouldn't have been when I was coming up like steric pants, <laughs> right? Uh, or, or, or certain types of color, color profiles we saw from the 90s becoming really popular again in, in, in today. So these kind of even fashion trends and chromatic trends come back around. And, and so um, nostalgia is inherent in how we think about, you know, time and, you know, people like me who are not just making art, but also in a position to collect art are reaching a point where they're nostalgic for the things of their youth, whether it be the 70s or the 80s or the 90s. That's not necessarily why I do it. It's not a, it's not a, a strategy to appeal necessarily in terms of like financial income or buy-in from collectors or things like that. Um, it's maybe a little bit more like a like around the idea like Sankofa, um, like looking back in order to move forward. So what we can learn from the past that can really help us understand the future. I, like, I think about um, 
I think it will be about Beyonce's performance at the Super Bowl where she introduced formation. It was hugely uh, loved and hugely uh, contested um, depending on who you were and what your relationship to her was, what your relationship to history was, especially when she was visually citing uh, um, through her clothing and through some of the literal formations of the dance dancers, uh, groups like the Black Panthers. We talked about the, 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 the fictional Black Panthers uh, in terms of you know, Marvel, but the actual Black Panthers um, were referenced in, in, her, in her, her performance. Um, she was looking to an aspect of, of Black history as a way of, of engaging visually, borrowing some, some of the, the labor and the symbology of the Black Panthers in order to invoke that into what her work was meaning to say and do in that moment today. Now, again, people have different relationships to the stories around the Black Panther. Some people don't know. Some people is just a scary, you know, bad guy from the past. Some people think about them as community heroes that, you know, provided food during Thanksgiving for families that couldn't afford, you know, and all, they, they perform so many different narratives in our history. The fact we're having a conversation about them is a big part, I think, in a meta way of her bringing it to a public consciousness with her profile. I don't want to, you know, I could, I could actually spend the whole rest of the time breaking down that as a, as, a, as a moment in American culture. I'd love to talk about that more. But that's some of, of what I hope to do is, is, is not all of, not, we, there's very little scratch anymore. <laughs> like making things from scratch, like biscuits. Like we ran out of scratch a long time ago. Like everything is sampled and resampled and borrowed. And if you can find uh, an element that informs you and your experience that from the past that has connected to you personally or is a way in for others in order to understand or put them in an arena of thought that you're interested in. Um, like for me, if I wanted to present uh, portraits on raw linen, aware that there may be allusions to Bacon or Leon Golub, you know, I also want to be conscious of the types of associations people have with their work. And hopefully, if I'm conscious of those things, those associations are, in some part will come into people's reads of my work. So that's some of my relationship to nostalgia and, and you know, nodding and sampling to the past. Uh, but thank you for that question. Okay, I'm unmuted now. Thank you, Patrick. Um, there is a question that I think you already answered, but I'm just going to read it out loud so that um, you know that I've recognized it. It's from Rafaela Ogbuta, and she asks um, what your inspiration um, is uh, from popular culture and media. And I think you sort of um, got into that just answering the question about nostalgia. So thank you, Rafaela, for your question. I'm just going to move into the next one from Kate Peasley. Um, she says, can you talk about the different way digital painting might ask you as an artist to engage your body as compared to traditional oil painting on a large scale? Yes, yes. Well, thank you. Um, I won't linger, but just tapping into that last question, uh, you know, uh, I spoke about that again in that answer, but I also spoke about it at the end in terms of just going into some of the things I'm into to make this, this whole direction in comics and the vampires and stuff like that. Um, but being able to, like, not having this hierarchy of division as an educator and as a maker is something that's been important to me, you know, whether it's the Ninja Turtles or it's uh, uh, Samurai Champloo or Full Metal Alchemist or Bruce Lee or uh, whatever it is, like, like, it's all material and I don't try to approach my making from an elite place that I'm only speaking to a very few. Um, and that, you know, I need to talk about references that only that very few would be interested or knowledgeable about. Like, I'm, you know, I'm speaking to people that might have similar experiences to me. So pop culture is, is culture. Uh, different ways digital painting might uh, engage my body. Well, first off, it was a learning curve, you know, like I like standing up, I teach standing up, I paint standing up. Um, I rarely work sitting down at an easel um, just because of the sense of scale, as you mentioned. Uh, even when I mix, I mix at a table. I'm standing up for three hours mixing. I've had to get, you know, some of those, uh, those uh, cushions, uh, cushion kind of uh, pads that go down. You'll see like behind the, 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 uh, the counters at, at stores and stuff that, that workers stand on. I had to get those because I've gotten older and my, my legs hurt. <laughs> so I guess a positive thing is I can sit down and work. 
A not positive thing is that I could sit down and snack while I work. <laughs> um, I also had to learn how to actually engage with the computer. Uh, I work on I work on a tablet. Uh, I am going to probably invest in a Cintiq uh, eventually, and that has a whole different set of problems. But you know, like staring at a computer all day, uh, not just to teach, but now to, to, to illustrate, it's it's hell on your neck. <laughs> you know, and, and so I had to learn like how far to be away from the screen, how to sit in a chair properly, how to hold my arm properly. I don't know if that's exactly what you're asking, but um, but physically there was so before I even get to the creative stuff, that was that was a logistics I had to figure out. Like like that was so different. Um, I am very fortunate to keep those memories in my body of working bigger. Um, something that I always struggled with from undergrad, I was, my background was in drawing originally. Something I struggled with originally when I moved to paint toward painting is how do I maintain the energy of my drawings and, and the, the, the attitude and the freshness and the immediacy in my paintings? Because I wasn't interested in like the paintings being something different. I, I, I like artists like uh, Sidney Goodman or Jim Dine that were really able to continue to, to allow that expressive mark to transverse across different, uh, different media. And so that was a long struggle to get psychically, psychologically um, to a place where I didn't see a big difference process-wise methodically between drawing and painting. When I started doing digital work, I was really conscious of maintaining that. I mean, if you probably, you might've seen in those earlier studies while they're just studies, uh, I want the same hand that I bring to my traditional paintings, my larger paintings to exist in the, in the, the digital work. And even though the screen is smaller or it's printed out smaller, I, didn't, I, don't, I don't want there to feel like there's a big, a big gap if, uh, to, if you see a reproduction of a larger work or, or digital work. Thank you, Patrick. And I think we have just one more question, um, again, from Rafaela Ogbuta. Um, did you establish a connection between your work and the COVID-19 era? Which I assume is maybe like a question um, about whether COVID has been generative as an experience for you. Um, yeah. No, I, I thank you, Rafaela. Um, I, I, I can see answering that question in two ways. Like how, like has the work, uh, has COVID, come into the work as a subject matter in some way? And also, uh, you know, how has it affected me because it exists in the world? So the first one, the second one's easy to answer. Um, very unhealthily, um, I'm being real here. I've always tried to be real and honor and vulnerable and earnest, even my teaching in my classes. Uh, I don't know if my students love it, but, you know, but I, I, I try to tell them the truth. And um, when COVID hit, America and it became very clear that it wasn't something that was just the flu. Uh, I was coming back from C2E2, which is Chicago's kind of Comic-Con and very luckily just coming from a, a pet place that could have been a huge hotspot and super spreader before we even used that term with thousands of people coming together to celebrate nerd culture. Uh, my wife and I made it out of that healthy. So that was great. But then once we got, you know, once we shut ourselves in and we're trying to respect, you know, others and how people are trying to, to protect themselves, and we want to protect ourselves. Um, I think I, I I won't say I can I can't clinically di diagnose this as depression, but I felt depressed. I I felt isolated. I felt alone. It was the summer, so luckily I wasn't like mentally prepared to go into the classroom and and, been sh and being shut down from that. So I was ready to be kind of on my own for the summer, but um, but we were finishing up classes and it was just a, a crazy time as everyone here lived through. Um, but that, and then exacerbated by, you know, many of the public figures we lost, um, you know, senators, uh, judges, celebrities, many of the, the, the just citizens we lost, as I mentioned earlier, just a few like George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. Um, you know, I, I really, I really got down, you know, and I, I just, I, I didn't know how to deal with it again, you know, just as another wave, as well as being oppressed and, and, and overwhelmed by, by COVID and, and, and the reality and the fear that was real and, and everything evolved with that. And so I threw myself into illustration and I didn't know how to do it. I literally, um, and my wife was very supportive from probably 
I would say late March all the way to July, I literally came down into my bed, into my basement here. I would watch TV after I had set all this up, it was very differently organized. I would watch TV and I would watch tutorial after tutorial on YouTube of how you use the Photoshop and these digital tools to do, to illustrate and to co do color and to do things. I knew how to do it with, with you know, traditional, you know, paints and, 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 and brushes and stuff, but I had to figure out how do you do it there. So I would watch hours and hours of these types of, of tutorials and I would spend hours and hours like trying different things out and experimenting and failing and being frustrated and snacking um, and sleeping, well not sleeping, and not sleeping. And so basically uh, what I would do is I, for three months, and this is, this is not hyperbole, I'd wake up at six in the morning, obsessed with learning more about illustration. I'd go to my, I'd get something to, to eat. I'd go to the basement and my studio here, and I would just work until I would go back up for food and for the restroom and stuff. But I literally worked till three in the morning. Every, every day for three months, I did that. And it wasn't healthy, you know, um, but I, I did, I did learn how to illustrate <laughs> and I got some, I've got some gigs now. So that was a productive thing that came out of it, but it wasn't healthy. I wouldn't suggest doing that, but it was my way of avoiding some of the realities. You know, I would, I would come out of my shell to, to, uh, to be active and support, you know, other people in the struggle. There were, there, you know, there were marches and there were things that were happening in the summer that are still happening now. And, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to be invisible or retreat from the world, but it was a time where I just needed to, to insulate myself from some of that. And that's what illustrate, that's what that's how COVID inspired me into this direction. It hasn't yet come into my work to get to your, the first kind of interpretation of your question. I don't know if or how I might make work about COVID. Um, I do have ideas for my next project though. Um, my next project is going to use this technology, uh, this digital technology to help me think through uh, two very, visible American narratives. While there's more American experiences than just two, black and white ones are huge. Hugely in, in, in impactful and influential, not just today, but in the infrastructure from the beginning of this project, of the American project to now. And um, combining that with these ideas of ethnogothic that I mentioned earlier of, of horror stories and how horror stories can be spaces for people who are marginalized or other and women to, uh, to find different ways of expressing their narrative through, through ways that might not be as, as um, direct or as a confrontational, but through allegory can still speak to that. If you're a horror fan, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, I really wanna look at this kind of a mutual American haunting where certain practices and ideologies that black people represent haunt white Americans, some white Americans, and some of the realities and practices of white Americans visibly and physically still haunt and threat, threaten black Americans. And I'm doing this through the, through the, the, the kind of conflation of, of two huge American experiences or some symbolic experiences, which are a soul train, you know, if you're maybe too young to know what Soul Train is, Google Soul Train. <laughs> um, but Soul Train is a site, you know, where, where Black people come together and celebrate and dance and, and feel a sense of, of, of joy and liberation. Uh, it was a queer space. It was a, 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 an excellent space. Uh, it was a, a, a Black run space, even though it was white owned. Um, but it was a speculative space, a speculative space that, that uh, promised Black futures. Uh, and lynching was, some people will say still is, uh, a speculative space, a picture of a white speculative space that dealt in, of course, violence toward real people, but also mentally was a space that was, that was set up and performed to secure white futures, to remove the threat and potential of what Black excellence might turn into, of owning the land, of, of, of succeeding in business, of, of race mixing, and other types of things. Like it was meant there to, as, a, as, a, as a fear tactic and as a, a practical tool to, to do violence in order to remove white fear. So I want to, I want to think about bringing these two speculative and, and you know, it's, 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 it's 
difficult to think about, but in many ways, both celebratory spaces, depending on who you were at the time, um, uh, together to talk about what we don't talk about, our different experiences. You know, like even with my own house, my wife is white. I never had pumpkin pie till we met. At, at the holidays, it wasn't something we did in my household. We had sweet potato pie. That's just pie. Like, just imagine how different our American experiences are. If, if I can open up space in this next project for us to talk about how we've collectively navigated this country differently and how we might confront some of our fears and some of our hopes, um, maybe it makes space a little bit today for us to find some more empathy and more common ground. But that's just a theory right now. I'm writing up grants proposals. I'm using the computer to do some digital collaging and thinking about you know, how these might actually be laid out, color palette and so on and so forth. I won't give too much away here. I know it's being recorded, so I can't give all my secrets away, but I hope you stay tuned and uh, look for that. Uh, it'll probably be a, a, another long form project that might take me you know, two or three, four or five years, but thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. That was really great. Thank you very much. So happy to, to share and your questions were amazing. You're so generous host. I really, really found this to be a great, pleasant experience.